morning. Welcome to Vineyard Church. Love having you today. You know, we are in between series. We finished off a series we did last week, and then we're going to begin a new one starting next week. We like to do a vision message at least twice a year so that we're all on the same page because it's so easy to get distracted. You just we forget what we're doing. Have you ever done that? Where you just did I accomplish anything today? Am I am I, you know, spending my time in, in worthwhile causes? And it can happen personally. It certainly can happen to a church. You know, in that Proverbs verse, if you're familiar with it, in King James it says, "Where there is no vision, people perish." Love that translation. It's kind of like we don't usually talk like that a whole lot, right? You per- did you perish? You know, but. But food perishes. But he says, no, vision causes us to perish. Something kind of dies inside. And um, the message translation on that same verse says, if people can't see what God's doing. He's talking about vision there. In other words, not just that you can see, the vision we're talking about is God's at work in your life. When you can't see what God's doing, you end up just stumbling. You end up making poor choices, falling all over yourself veering off the path. I mean, all kinds of stuff. But when you attend to what he reveals, that's where God's blessing is. And so I want God's blessing on your life. I'm sure you want that as well. And so we want to talk about getting vision in your life so that when you wake up each day, you're filled with an ass- just vision, an assignment God has for you. You know God's using you and You know what it is to be blessed. Now, Vineyard, we all come together. We make up Vineyard Church. And our corporate vision is four parts right here. Vineyard's vision for the lost to get saved, the saved to get pastored, the pastor to get trained, and the trained to get mobilized. And so it's these four parts that are the four parts of vision God has for for you, for those four things to happen in your own life, for you to come to Christ, for you to step into this place of being pastored and then trained and then ultimately mobilized. Now, we don't use this language a whole lot uh, because we have found, you know, Sharon and I started this church 26 years ago and the vision stayed the same, but sometimes the language has changed for it to make sense to people. And here's what we've discovered is it makes more sense when we talk in these terms. Knowing God. Instead of the lost being saved, which is knowing God, we just say to know God. That's that's our vision for you and for our church, that you know God. Know Him not just intellectually, but you know Him personally. That He's an power, all-powerful God that you have a personal relationship with. Not just some distant deity out there in the cosmos somewhere, and you have faith in that. No, you, you know God personally. Relate, he's, he's a friend of yours. And that's what God offers. That's what Jesus said when he, when he, in his ministry to the disciples, he said, hey, my job is so that you'll be friends with God. That was his, that was his goal, that the saved would, that the lost would be saved. So knowing God's an important part, that leads to finding freedom, that we actually step out and discover what God has for us because we're freed from the past. We get stuck in our past. All of us have a past, and that can keep us from really embracing what God has for us. But once we know God, He gives us the power to find freedom. So often, people often think, oh, well, I need to get my life together before I, you know, get baptized, before I start going to church, before I start to get to know God. But the truth is, you can't do that. It's going to God, letting God his power come into your life and ab- helping you get through that stuff, letting that stuff go, letting all of those things go. That's where we find freedom is by knowing God. Then we discover our purpose. And that's what God has for you. He wants you to know your purpose. Not guessing, not hoping. You know. You know your purpose. But you can't, and that's your future, what God's shooting you towards. But you can't do that if you're stuck in the past. You haven't found freedom. And then ultimately, you make a difference. You make a difference, uh, an eternal difference, really making a difference in people's lives. Now, the problem is when we don't see God's vision for our life, 
we can fall for one of the devil's counterfeits. There's a lot of counterfeits, and, and, he, and he'll try to get you to veer off and do something. He's not, the devil's happy getting you to do something that is not necessarily bad, but it's not what God wants you to do in your life. In other words, he's not, he's not trying to make everybody a heroin dealer. He's, he's okay you doing good things as long as they're not things that make a difference in eternity, as long as they're not what you were called to do in your life. You're just kind of frittering away your time. He's okay with you binging on Netflix until the cows come home, as long as you're not making a difference with your life. And so we got to be careful we don't fall for a earthly counterfeit. Here's what they might look like. Instead of knowing God, it's all about me. Know me. I want to, you know, it's all about me. And, and there's a lot of reinforcements in our society that can talk to you about, you know, hey, it's all about you. You, 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 you. Social media is a great example. I mean, I love social media. I'm on the different platforms. I love to post pictures and stuff. But there's a tendency for social media to just promote yourself. You're not really interested in others. It's just your next, you know, your next photo you can, you can post and see how many likes you got. And, oh, I didn't get as many likes as last time. And it's, that's all. It's, it's, it's not about others. And I don't want to pick on social media. There's plenty in our society that can cause us to get involved in just knowing me. It's not about God. I don't really know what, care what God's up to. And then finding fame. I, I, it doesn't matter if I'm, if I'm in bondage as long as people don't know about that, as long as they think I'm successful by the car I drive, by the kind of job I have, the kind of vacations I can take, the neighborhood I go to, the schools my kids can go to, I, as long as people think I'm doing well, that's all that's matter. That's, that's fame instead of really being free in your life and instead of discovering a purpose, discovering, you know, I just want a platform, a platform I can speak from and I'm just going to make a dollar. And so that's settling that is, and here's the thing, is the devil promises joy and blessings and peace and freedom with these things. They're empty promises. Only God really gives those things that really satisfy. And so, so many people buy in to these counterfeits, hoping they're going to deliver on their promises, only to find they climbed the ladder of success, but it was leaning on the wrong wall. It wasn't the right ladder to climb. And so, God says, no, I've got a plan for you. Now, as your pastor, I pray this, I pray over you every day. Every day I'm praying for you, particularly in 2020, but always. I pray for you, and here's one of my core prayers. It's a prayer that Paul prayed also over the church. And here's what he said. He said, I'm praying, or I keep asking God of our Lord Jesus Christ that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation. For what? Well, so that you might know him. That's that first part of the vision, that you would know God. And if you already know him, that you would know him better, that you'd know him better. Some of you are discovering you're in your faith walk. You're in a pilgrimage trying to figure out all this stuff. And God's saying, I want you to know him. How do you do that? Well, let me tell you, it's through a spirit of wisdom and revelation. It's not just intellectual. Have you ever tried to argue somebody into making a decision for Christ? It doesn't work too well. I've done that. And those, you just argue and argue. Well, have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about this? I mean, the woman at the well, when Jesus talks in John 4, she keeps trying to sidetrack Jesus into some religious arguments and, and his opinions on politics. And he just cuts to the chase right there. Hey, you want living water? You've got... You've got something going on in your soul. There's an emptiness. I can fill it with living water. When Peter is preaching and he's speaking to the, earth, the, the, when the birth of the church at Pentecost, it says there that he, he doesn't just use a bunch of logical arguments. It says they were cut to the heart. You see, it's a spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's what ushers in the Holy Spirit so we can know him and know him down in our knower. Did you know you got a knower? You got to know her. I love that phrase. That's, I didn't make it up. They've been using it for hundreds of years in the church. But they say, you know, you know when you're a knower. Well, what is that? Well, listen, you can't explain it to somebody who's outside of the faith. 
But I can tell you the best explanation I've ever seen is right here. It's a spirit of wisdom and revelation. God opens you up. All of a sudden you know, God, I know him. And I know I know him. And then he goes on. He's, I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened. So he says, well, I know you got eyes in your head, but you also have eyes in your heart. What in the world? He's talking about the way we see life. We all see the objects around us the same, but our perception of what we bring to it has a filter. Kind of like in some of the, you know, Instagram and different social media, you can select, what kind of filter do I want on? Well, we, we have filters, and they're the eyes of our heart. And it's based on our experiences of our past, religious experiences we've had, uh, relational experiences, then we've been, when we've been hurt, when we, we carry bitterness, we carry unforgiveness, we, all different kinds of struggles and fear, all kinds of things in our past. And he goes, hey, I, I, I'm going to pray for an enlightenment to happen so you can find freedom from that stuff, that you're not stuck in your past and all those things that have happened. So he, that you would know God, that you would find freedom, and also that you would discover your purpose. You see, everyone has a calling. God's got a call on your life. Not just for ministry. Sometimes we think, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's you're called into ministry. No, everybody has a calling. You have a, a, a purpose to live for. And he says, there it is. He goes, it gives us hope. That's, that, that's where you find hope. Often we try to find joy, hope, peace in our lives by resolving a bunch of problems in our lives. You know, if I just eliminate these problems, then... I'll be happy. Then I'll find joy in my life. But he goes, no, actually, it comes from discovering your purpose. You wake up in the morning, you go, I've got a purpose to live for. And then he goes on and he talks about the glorious inheritance, which is making a difference. He goes, this, you'll, you, you'll know you're making a difference. That's the greatest experience in your life is when you can make a real difference in somebody's life. I mean, when you go to bed at night and you put your head on your pillow and you go, I, somebody was really in need in my life and I was able to make a difference in their life. There's, there, you can't buy that. You can't buy that. That is something that comes, uh, it's an inheritance that God wants you to have. Now, life will always be filled with problems. So if you're waiting for joy and hope and all those things to come when your problems are gone, it's not going to happen because life is just a series of exchanging one set of problems for another set of problems. You go, well, Andy, that's pretty negative. Can't you be more positive about this? Well, yeah, I'm positive life is filled with problems. One set of problems for another set of problems. I remind myself of that as well, because I, like all of you, want to get rid of the problems in my life. If I just get rid of this, if I can just solve this, I'll be happier, I'll be happier. Listen, happiness, joy, hope comes from knowing I have a purpose. You see, it's not about solving your problems that brings hope and joy and peace in our lives. It's having a purpose bigger than those problems. You have something greater that you're living for. And then he says here, ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance. He talks about the glorious inheritance, that we get to make a difference. We make a difference in the nations and all the earth and the possessions. I mean, he says that, we get to make a difference in people's lives. And, you know, I particularly think um, Hampton Roads, South Hampton Roads, w we have a unique opportunity to impact the nations because it's a military town. We have literally people from all over the world come here, all over the United States every month, transferring in. They hear, they're here for two, three, four, five years, sometimes longer. And then they, sometimes they retire here, and, but they're still traveling all over the world. This is a major hub of impact. It's a vortex. And so you have, when, when we make a difference in our community, it disproportionately impacts the rest of the nation and the world. That's a huge honor, a huge privilege. You are here for a reason. God wants to use you to make a huge difference. Not a little one, a big one. Let's look at the vision, but we're going to go backwards this time. You know, last series 
we did this. We talked about having 30 days to live, kind of starting with the end in mind because it can help you to be more focused. So let's do that with the vision today. Starting with the end in mind, mobilize. This is the last part of our vision. Mobilize to make a difference. God wants you to make a difference. Now in business, they refer to, uh, they have some scale they use to find out how we, how we you know, using our resources to make the biggest difference, and they call it the ROI, results on investment, return on investment. In the church, we like to refer to it as the E-R-O-I, the eternal return on investment, right? I mean, we have so much time, money, energy. As we sow that into the kingdom of God, as we use what God's given us and, the, and, and, and team up with the local church, the local church mobilized is the hope of the world. I mean, now, outside of the church, they're looking for answers. Hopefully, government can solve the ills of the world. Hopefully, business can. Maybe education can. All of those take a little chunk at it. But the real solution is the transformation of the human heart that God does, and he uses the local church to do it. So we have this great opportunity to make an eternal difference, an eternal difference, not a little one, a big one. And we can all do way more than what any one of us can do. I don't care how gifted you are, how wealthy you are. You, you can, if you throw all of that in, it's still not going to make the impact that all of us can make. We all come together and there's a synergy. There's a power that happens. And the synergy also comes because Jesus is involved. Jesus says that wherever two or more are gathered, I'm there. He's like, you get to invite him on your team. You ever play, you know, high school sports? Like at PE, really, right? And there, you know, and you have to like, you know, who's on whose team? And you're there going, dang, yeah, I'm gonna be like, you know, I just don't, I just don't want to be fifth last. You know, that's that that became my wish. You know, I mean, you know, just don't, I just don't want to be last. That's like the worst. You know, and the first person got picked was super athletic. What's, well, you know, I mean, we get Jesus on our team. That's a good guy to have on your team when you're trying to make an eternal impact. Jesus, hey, I'm on your team. And that synergy, the power that comes to make a difference in people's lives. Jesus said, this is to my Father's glory that you should bear much fruit. He's talking about E-R-O-I, right? Return on investment for eternity. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. I have told you this so that your joy may be in you and your joy may be full or complete. He says, when you make a difference in somebody's lives, that's what brings real fulfillment, real joy. Now, secular psychologists will tell you that today. I mean, it's, you know, like they made it up. Jesus was talking about it 2,000 years ago. Hey, if you want more happiness in your life, go, they, they call it transcendence, go do something for somebody else. It'll bring up your endorphins. You know, it'll make you feel better. Jesus says, it's more than endorphins. When you're making an internal impact in somebody's lives, it, you're going to be filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. God's really good. Because you're, you're, you're going to say, this is what I was made for. I was made for this. My life will only be as successful as the cause that I attach to it. Some people, they give first-class effort and commitment to second-class causes. Not all causes are the same. You know, they say the millennials want a cause to live for. Great. I think everybody needs a cause to live for. But not all causes are the same. It's not just go find a cause. When we're Christ followers, we're, God wants us to find the right cause, a cause that will make an eternal impact in people's lives. And so we want to make sure and say, God, I want to sign up and do, do, do your mission, do what you're doing. And God is at work in the local church. But let me just say, Satan pushes back. You, there is a warfare going on. There's, there's Satan going, nah, 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 you're wasting your time praying. You're wasting your money giving. You're wasting your efforts by serving in the kids' ministry or handing out a cup of coffee or serving on the dream team or, get, you know, in the food pantry or doing missions. I mean, Satan's going to try to, you know, say, ah, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that because he knows the power of the church unified. So he's always trying to cause strife, envy, anything he can. For envy and strife is there's confusion and every evil work. That's, that's Satan's handiwork right there. 
He's trying to cause confusion, strife. Another translation for this ver- verse is, you know, self-interest. It's all about me, all my self-interest. I'm not there to serve. Of course, Jesus demonstrated, hey, we're, as Christ followers, he served. We certainly need to serve as well. So this is, an, we just, we're aware. Hey, we know what you're up to, Satan. I'm not falling for that. I'm going to make a difference with my life. But that can't happen until I discover my purpose. I need to know why I'm here. I need to be able to know my purpose, what God's called me to do. That is an important part of our walking out our, our faith. And God reveals his purpose through the way he's wired us. In other words, our design reveals our destiny. And we join, we want to help you to figure that out. So with the uh, with making a difference, that's our dream team. We come together, where Jesus is on our team. With discovering our purpose, that's in growth track. And so we have growth track to help you to figure out what is my design? What is my purpose? And we run growth track every week, every month of the year. I mean, that's how important it is to us. It's not a side thing. It's a central part of our vision. That's why Sharon and I personally teach those classes. We, we want to not only meet you, get to, but we want you to hear our heart. We want to make sure that you get this part of our vision of our church, that you're, you have a purpose, and we want you to discover that, to know your purpose. Why am I here? So that when you get up in the morning, you're fired up. You're not just working to you know, nine to five to get some bills, to get some money to pay the bills, live for the weekend, retire and die. Life is more than that. God has a purpose for you. And he wants you to know that purpose. And so we have step one, step two, step three, step four. Step one is always at the first Sunday of the week, of the month, first Sunday of every month. What's today? First Sunday. Perfect time to get involved. If you have not taken Step one in growth track, you're unclear about your purpose. We invite you right after the service. As you're leaving, you'll see a sign there that says growth track. A nice person standing there with a big smile saying, come on in here. We have something for you to eat. We'll watch your kids. It's only about 45, 50 minutes long. And begin that process so you can take step one today, right after the service. And we start moving on that. Notice this verse with me. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Now, you put armor on when you know you're in a fight, right? So he says, hey, you've got a fight here. And if, you're, if you've taken a step into your faith with Christ, you know that. There's a pushback. It's not easy. You make a decision for Christ. You go home. You tell somebody. And the first thing they say often is, what, are you crazy? What's, you know, why would you need that? Do you need a crutch? You start getting, the enemy starts speaking through people, but it's the enemy, make no mistake, starts speaking things to try to chip away at your faith. So he says, hey, you got to be strong, put on your armor, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes. The devil's going to tr- throw all kinds of things at you, to s- his scheme, he's scheming to throw you off your game. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual struggle, but against, and he lists four things, rulers, against authorities, powers of the dark world, and spiritual forces of evil. How in the world do you fight against that? It sounds like, man, I don't think I'm going to win that war. Yeah, yeah, you can. But here's what he says. He says, not only have your armor on, but he says, pull out your sword. You need to go on the offense. And you do that, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He's talking about the Bible. He's talking about that. Some of you... Your struggle is real. You're not doing well. You're actually failing. You, you can't seem to get on the right side of the, of the war on this thing. And here's your answer right here. You need to get into God's Word. God has, wants to equip you so that you can fight the war that you can win. The, the, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine powers to demolish strongholds strongholds that you've had in your life so long you've just accepted them god says i'm going to demolish those and you're going to see a huge huge change i I believe that i believe 2020 is going to be a major comeback for a number of you 
that you've had setback after setback after setback to where you have almost given up or you have. And God's saying, I'm ready for a comeback. Everybody loves a great comeback. We're going to start a series this coming week called The Great Comeback. And I want you to invite somebody to that. Now, you have an invite card in your, in your program. That's not for you. You're going, hey, this is cool. I can put this on my refrigerator. That's not for your refrigerator. If I visit your house this week, I better not see it on your fridge. You're going, you're not coming by. Well, probably not, right? But I'm just letting you know that is for somebody else. You go and you find somebody, look for the opportunity, and pray for the courage. Look for the opportunity and pray for the courage. Make sure that flyer is with you. And, uh, you know, if you're super digital, then just take a picture of it. So it's on your, it's on your phone. So if you look for the opportunity, you don't have the flyer, you've got, you got, you got the photo. You can say, hey, can I, can I shoot this over to you? I want to invite you. You want to be here for this. So invite somebody to come uh, because they need to hear that. Or, of course, if they want to do online, you know, we have online services. So that's certainly an option there. Then we find freedom. Again, finding freedom can't, these things are, they, they build one on the other. We can't discover our purpose if we're always looking in our rearview mirror. We're stuck with bitterness and unforgiveness and anger and, 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 and these things that have hold it, the, the, the eyes of our heart have a filter that just, they're really clouding the future. We can't embrace what God has for us. And so finding freedom, that happens in small groups. Small groups is really important. You hear about that all the time. We have three semesters in our church. We have a short one in the summer. And then we have one in the fall, and we have one in the spring. Now, in the fall, one is just beginning. We just started last week. Uh, we, in, a, in the small group I'm part of, uh, two of the people couldn't make it, so they're going to be coming this coming week. So, I mean, the groups are just starting. This is the perfect time to get involved in a small group. You go, how do I get involved in one? Well, you go to vineyardchurch.com, and on there we have our small group ministry. And you, you look them over, find one. Most of them, let me just tell you, are here in the church. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, we have child care. You can come. We have, we're, coming, we're coming in. We worship together. Then we break into the different rooms throughout uh, the, 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 the church building and make sure we have our masks on, social distancing and all that. We're, that hasn't changed. But we're, we need to be together, my friends. There's something powerful when the church comes together. Now, the Bible talks about the church. Is, the Greek word is ekklesia which means the gathering or the coming together. That's when we come together. There's, there's, you know, there's certain parts of the, the, the New Testament you can't even do unless you're with people, unless you can come together. Now, online church has been kind of an experiment, you know, for the church and really all throughout the world. We haven't had a pand- pandemic in 100 years, and this technology wasn't around back then. And so before that, it was kind of theoretical. Is, is, it, is this a great way to do church or not, you know, online? And now it's no longer theoretical, we know. I've been talking to pastors all throughout the country, and they're all saying, yeah, people are disappearing. People are leaving. They, they're not, they started out kind of with a high attendance, but then after a while they get distracted, and then they just stop watching. They're not on the Zoom, on the small group. They're just not interacting. They're not serving in any way. They're not reading their Bible. They're not praying. In fact, they're just doing other things. Now, some people stay home, and their roots are deep and mature in their faith, and they stay home because they need to, because of, you know, comorbidity. They have concerns with their health, rightly so, and they're doing okay. But that is the minority. Most people do not have that kind of mature faith, and so when they're distant, they just kind of fall off the map, and they're gone. It's, and so it's, a, it's an issue. And you know what? We're meant to be together. The devil loves to isolate people. Isolation causes us just to fall into a hole of depression and self-pity and all kinds of crazy stuff. We're meant to come together and encourage one another. And so I'm glad you're here. (laughs) Because this is part of what it means to be a Christ follower saying, hey, I'm going to get up, I'm going to get out of my PJs and put, you know, some clothes on and some cologne and perfume and fix my hair and get in the car and go to church. And we're the, the ecclesia, the, 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 where I can encourage one another and gather together and 
Small groups is an important part of that because there's some elements of our growth that happens where people know you by name, know what you're going through. That doesn't happen in the bigger group. You know, I've been part of small groups, either led them or been involved in them for several decades. It's interesting, they always start out the same. They always start out, people don't really know each other. You got the big name tag, you're talking, everyone's glancing at the name tag, you know, who are you? You know, and then you, hey, how you doing? And everybody's, nobody wants to really share how they're doing with a bunch of strangers. You know, like, so everybody's fine, you know. How you doing? I'm fine. Well, are you sure? Yeah, I'm fine. No, what, that's not really true. You know, he argued with his, his wife all the way to the small group. You know, they're just like fighting like cats and dogs, but they're fine. You know, I'm good to go. But after three, four weeks, five weeks, they start to trust, let their guard down, take their mask off, start to share some things that are going on in their life. And God uses that. And healing starts to happen. I love this verse where it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can be healed. Something happens because we all have things that are going on in our lives. We have stuff in our past, but we also have stuff in our present that we're struggling with. And sometimes it's, it's just downright embarrassing. We don't know how to share it. We'd love to. We just don't know who, who to share it with. We all need people we can open up with. I like to say it like this. You're only as sick as your secrets. See, there's sick, you know, like physically sick, and then there's the other kind of sick. Spiritually sick, emotionally sick, mentally you're not doing well. And God brings the church together so we can be healed, we can grow in that area. And, of course, that is built all on knowing God. You see, we want to make a difference with our lives so we can our joy may be full or it can be complete. We put our head on our pillow at night knowing we're really making a difference, that we've attached ourselves to the right cause. But that can't happen if we don't know our purpose. And God wants you to know in your knower that he has a purpose for you, that you're just not born by accident and just happenstance. No, you were born with a purpose and you have a purpose he never gives up on it we give up on ourselves all the time god never gives up on you and your purpose is as real today regardless of what you've done in the past as it's ever been you go well god's got some catching up to do well you know he's able to do that he's done that many times in the bible we see people that finally get on board with god's plan when they're 80 and he seems to do just fine if you're wondering who I was thinking of, is that's Moses. Moses is off doing his own thing for 80 years. And at 80, he goes, you know what? I think I'll serve the Lord. We all know the Moses story. Some pretty, God used him in some pretty great ways. No matter how old you are, no matter what you've done with your life, God has a purpose for you. But you'll never find it if you don't find freedom first. You get freed from that stuff. Take that, the eyes of your heart, that filter, get it off. And you start to see things the way God wants you to see things. And you get the power of God in your life going, which is from knowing Him. Knowing God, having your identity intact, having your conscience clean, letting the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life to overcome things you could never, ever do on your own. And this is a new day for you. A new day when you receive this vision into your life that I'm going to know God. And I'm going to know him better. I'm going to find freedom. I'm going to discover my purpose. And I'm going to make a difference. Let's bow our heads and pray. We'll come Holy Spirit right now in this place. Lord, I thank you for every courageous person who's sitting here right now. On their, some of you on your way to church, you were, you were struggling with some doubts. You were wondering about some things. Doubts about yourself. Maybe you're contemplating throwing the, the towel on, some, on, on a relationship. Maybe you're wondering, will God really speak to you today? I'm telling you, God's voice wants to ring true in your heart right now. 
lift you up. Speak into the place that you're in. God says, no more self-pity. He says, I want to pull you out of your isolation and surround you with people that will encourage you and pray for you. God says, I'm going to bring healing once and for all. The pain will end. And there will be a new sun, a new, a new day, a new sunrise, and joy will fill your heart. God says he's got a vision for you, and his promises that are attached to that vision are not empty. Today, I'm just going to ask you to pray right where you're at. Would you just pray, God, I want to make a difference. I'll be ruthless about the cause I'm attaching my life to. If it needs to change, I will change it because I want to make an eternal difference. Would you say, God, help me to discover my purpose? And I'm just going to courageously just ask you to pray about taking growth track. Step one today. Maybe you had other plans, but you know what? If you're, not, if you're fuzzy on that, there is nothing more important in your life right now than getting straight on that. So God, I want to know my purpose. I want to find freedom. And I want to know you. If you've never put your faith in Christ, or maybe you're just far from God. Somehow you're just, years ago you had a relationship, but now you're in the wilderness somewhere. You're in the desert. God's saying, come on home. Drink from the living water. God says, I want to fill you up and let you have the joy that your heart desires. Do that right now. Would you just pray with me? Just say right in your heart, in your mind. Just say, God, today I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Give me a clean conscience. Give me a fresh start. And Lord, enable me. Give me that power. Not in my own strength, because I know I can't do that, but by your strength, God, let me walk in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, that's a great start. It always begins that way just with a simple prayer and then god starts to do his great and awesome work i want to know about you if you prayed with me if you said hey i'm recommitting my life to christ i want to follow god let me know about it we have a couple ways one is the program that you got as you came in on the connect card you can just write on there andy i prayed with you you can also text it to me 704-5504 and then just put in know god and we'll help you with your next steps that's important But let me just cut to the chase. Your next step is step one. Step one in growth track, which is right after the service as you go out, one hour long. We want, I'll be in there. Love to see you in there. Also, we'd love to hear about any prayer requests you have. Just type in pray, same number. Of course, on your Connect card, you can write any prayer requests. And for those of you who support what we're doing here through giving, investing, and making an eternal return on your investment, no greater return on your investment eternity-wise than investing in what God's doing. And certainly, God is changing lives and changing nations through this church. And so unashamedly, I say, and I I contribute as well. I love it. It's one of my greatest honors to contribute to the work that God is doing here in Vineyard. And that's an easy way for you to do it. There's other ways, of course, giving a check and putting it in the box on the way out. In fact, uh, that clear box on the way out, that's where you can put any kind of message you have for us. It comes straight to us. Would you stand with us? Uh, I want to close in a final worship song, just a way to kind of reflect on what God's doing in our lives. For some of you, you made a monumental decision of following Christ. I don't want to just run away and do something like, you know, something else, go to lunch. Let's pause for a moment. Just take our commitment and put that as like an offering before the Lord. Say, God, you know how much I love you, how much I want to follow you. I want to do this for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord for our opportunity to worship you, to lift you up, to honor you. 
You've done so much for us, Lord. We want to just love you back. And we do that right now in song. In Jesus' name.